Hello everyone and welcome to today's AI Ops webinar. My name is John O'Hearn and I'm a Principal Solutions Marketing Manager here at BMC. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Carlos Casanova, Forrester's Principal AI Ops Analyst. And Carlos is one of the world's leading AI Ops Analysts. He has a profound understanding of the intricacies of the AI Ops markets, key players in this space, the AI Ops solutions that are available to customers and the emerging technologies that are coming out. So Carlos, thank you so much for joining us today. And would you like to say hello to everyone? Thanks, John. Really appreciate the, um, uh, the invitation to speak today and uh, really excited to cover the, you know, some of those intricacies, some of the nuances of AI ops and some of the drivers that are uh, really pushing this forward. Yeah, that's great, Carlos. Thanks for that. And look, I can't wait for everyone to hear your take on the AI ops markets. The, advance, the emerging advancements in the space, and, and of course, right, the overview of the recent uh, Forrester process-centric AI ops wave, we're all really excited to, to hear about that. But we're also gonna hear some other things, like the key criteria customers should consider when they're selecting an AI ops solution, uh, and why now, I guess, is the right time to begin accelerating customers' journey towards AI ops. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Carlos, who's gonna take it through today's presentation. Well, thanks again, John. I really appreciate, uh, again, the opportunity and to everyone listening in today. Uh, you know, when we look at AI ops, it is, it's a, a term that is being used considerably more now. And the, the rationale behind a lot of that really is being driven by some of the organizational challenges that, that we're facing, that enterprises are facing. And one of the key elements on this is is the expectations of customers, users, employees, you know, and, and what experience they're having with the systems, both, you know, in their nine to five job, after after work, when they're shopping, when they're booking travel. And it is the full experience from take, for example, in an airline, in an airline area, you know, the experience with the that airline company starts with the ticketing and it ends with the full trip going through. So it, it really has to carry. And what that means is for a business, the velocity that they have to respond with, how quickly they have to pivot to a competitor or an issue that just arose, it's really, it's really driving them to have to be just so much more nimble and agile. And because of that, the complexity in the IT environments has to match that. It has to match it at speed, it has to match it at scale. And what that does is it, it leaves this complexity behind that we have to figure out from an IT perspective, how do we provide that? How do we provide that for organizations? And when we look at, you know, there's throughout this, uh, this presentation, I pulled out some data points of research that we've, that Forrester has done. And in this one in particular, it's around product management. And you look at the priority for organizations and what they're investing in. What are their high priorities? What are their middle level priorities? And these numbers are, are pretty significant. I mean, they're, these aren't 40s and 50%. So in all of our respondents, 88% accelerating their move to digital, ability to innovate, 89% of organizations are investing in that. That's their high priority. And, and key underpinning a lot of this is resilience. So 87% are increasing their operational resilience. That's what they're setting as their, their high priorities and the middle priorities. So that that should really you know, help you understand that this you're not alone, or frankly, if you are alone, you really need to think twice about this. If you're in that 12%, that 11%, 13% here on this slide, that is not setting these as your middle and high priorities. You really need to think twice on, you know, do you expect to survive? Do you expect to go forward? And as I said, you know, and, and John called out earlier in the intricacies, AI ops is so broad. And when I when I took over this coverage area, you know, almost two years ago, there the definitions weren't out there. The background, the research wasn't there to support a lot of this. And the more and my more I dug into it, you know, I looked at AI ops and it said it's it is broad, it is deep, and it is broad. So you see through this word cloud a lot of experiential type terms, a lot of contextual type terms, but it also drives all the way down into the technology. And, you know, so I set out, I said, okay, this is everything that it, it's made up of, but what exactly is AI ops? And, uh, you know, I highlight here some key terms, 
human and technological application of AI ML. And so AI ops is not just the technology, that's how we kind of deliver some of this, but it is for an enterprise, it's the practice that combines that human and technolo technological application of AI ML. It helps and enhances human judgment. So it goes through some of that data that you have already, it's your enterprise data, and it's bringing to light saying, hey, we've done this before, we've done it 75 times, this is how we responded. Here's what you know what you should go forward with. Once you see those patterns and those trends start formulating and really kind of coming to light, it really enables the opportunity for automation, which is key back to the business velocity to really enable that velocity. And ultimately, you know, the, the bottom line in all this is really it's AI enriched actionable information. We're, we're leveraging these technologies now, AI enhanced and AI embedded technologies to ultimately you know, act, to, to provide us information, not just data, but information, knowledge, wisdom, to really act on these, uh, on these things that are being surfaced. So as I, as I noted earlier, you know, there really wasn't a lot of research in place. So I, I set out to build this reference architecture. And what, I, what ultimately we landed on was 18 different capabilities. So you know, I noted you know, the depth of AI ops, the breadth of AI ops. And if you look at this uh, reference architecture, there's, you know, any one of these boxes is a huge effort, right? You know, the experiential, it encompasses employee experience, customer experience, user experience, the whole digital experience monitoring space, analytics, obviously across the board, you know, the, the ingestion phase, it's bringing it in, you know, your static data, but it also has all the real-time data. So again, it's a, it's a really big ask for organizations and, the enterprises that are setting out on this on this path really have to take this into account to say, okay, we're going to bring all this data together to ultimately utilize it, you know, through alerting, through automation. Uh, the automation could be full automation through remediation, or it could just be automating pieces throughout the um, the, the workflow here. So again, from from that same product management survey, you know, we we've been talking, you know, I've touched on already, you know, in just a short time. The experience piece and along with those the innovation and the resilience metrics that we found 92 percent of organizations or respondents are are setting as a priority high and medium priority to improve experience of the customers which is huge you know the customer centricity the user centricity is driving all of this because technology can be up and running but if it's a bad experience then it really doesn't matter if the technology was running. If the users, the customers, the employees are having good experiences, then that's really the goal. That's where it is. So, you know, 88% on the employee side of experience, 92% on the customer side of the experience. That, that's really vital. One of the other topics that is really, really hot right now, and in, in my opinion, the word is being used inappropriately many times because it's kind of being band-aid you know, band everywhere and anywhere. So I, I do want to kind of bring out the observability piece is part of this discussion, but observability is much more of an inside out or systems oriented view looking outward. And there's sort of two sides to this coin because for the systems, there has to be an inherent ability to let other things know, let technologies know how I'm behaving, what I do, what I don't do. And that's you know how it's putting out some of the metrics, the logs and that sort of information. And it's putting that out through these externalized outputs. If you're building a system for a secure environment, obviously you don't wanna share a lot. If it's an open environment, you're gonna share more. Then on the other, the other half of this relationship is the technologies that are taking all that data and then they're exploring it. They're looking at how are you behaving? How is the system behaving relative to other systems around it? So it's doing that, that exploration. It's looking for those behavioral patterns. It's doing this in real time. So it has to have that visibility in real time to ultimately drive the insights that drive the actionable um, actions. You know, and, and that's, that's again, that actionable information is really the key is that's how you support the best experiences for individuals. So I, I set out, like the AIOps reference architecture, also put together the observability reference architecture so that we have a starting point of conversation 
And the same way the AIOps one had the telemetry and sensory data, so does, um, so does the, the observability one. And when you look around this reference architecture, you know, it should make sense to, to you, like, what are we doing? How are we doing it? And how it's a little bit more focused. So like I said, observability is that inside out systems view. AIOps is the broader outside in view that takes the metrics, logs, and traces, takes the exploration, takes all that information and leverages it. So this is sort of a stacked view of how you should envision from monitoring through observability, through AI ops. I, I actually have a blog that speaks to this around, you know, the monitoring being a veterinarian, You the pet comes in and all they can do is mount, monitor it. They can react to what happened. Observability is when you get into a relationship with say a doctor, it's a much more active engagement. So that's what observability is doing. It's exploring, the patient comes in, it sees that it's limping, but it says, hey, you know, Mr. Smith, what happened? How did it happen? Has it happened before? And it really is able to engage with the patient. So it still takes all the reactive information. It then starts getting into this active stage. And then with the patient still there, it's able to say, you know, you should avoid this, you should avoid that. So it's a proactive uh, aspect as well. When we get to AI apps, like I said, it's a much bigger umbrella, it still takes that observability piece. But when you think about it in terms of a biomechanical engineer, it's say, for example, a really sophisticated prosthetic, or it's a glucose pump, and it sees that the sugar levels in the body are dropping. So it addresses that immediately and you know, proactively, even potentially predictively. And then it addresses maybe the kidneys that are failing. So that's where it takes that advanced automation. It's part of the system. It's part of the whole ecosystem. So when you look at AI ops, like I said, it expands all the way down to reactive for monitoring, covers all of the observability, active and proactive, and then adds on top of it the predictive piece. So super, you know, super complex, but it it's why why we need all that data, all that sensory data, that telemetry to really do things um, you know, in that real time and ideally in a predictive time. So from our future fit survey, you know, when you think about all that data that I was calling out, again, look at what organizations, what enterprises are adopting. They're adopting at 83% um, level, we're gonna establish a data operations practice. We're going to expand our data engineering practice to support the deployment of AI. And, and why is that? Because this, you're looking at this level of data. It's a huge, huge amount of data that organizations have to deal with and contend with. There's no way that at a, to maintain the business velocity, to keep up with the speed of the business, that I, IT can really do this in a manual way. So it has to employ some of these technologies to sort out the noise, to filter these things out, to elevate the signals that a customer service person or a monitoring engineer or a network engineer is, is presented with. And then more importantly is here it is, but here's the historicals. Here's what we've done in the past. Here's how we've responded to that. Here's the success rates of that. So there's a huge amount of volume, a huge amount of uh, data that needs to be processed in real time or near real time so that we can take these actions, take these steps, uh, much, much more quickly. And, you know, where is it? It's everywhere. It, you know, AI is, is everywhere and it can be used everywhere. Uh, important to understand is, you know, I, I joke all the time that AI, it's not artificial and it's not intelligence. It's just math. And, and a large part it is. I mean, obviously the models, the learning models, large learning models that are underpinning this from the machine language, uh, the machine learning side is is vital. But when you think of, how it's being employed and how it could be employed, you don't, we don't really need to be as scared of it as we often are because of this sort of black box and, and where it is. So look at, you know, you look at some of these scenarios and how it's being used. You know, these aren't scary things. And when you think of a human has to do these anyway, there's just so much opportunity to, to leverage this, this massive capability. So we already see it in all of these areas. There's, dynamic thresholding. It's just simply streamlining tasks. It's reducing some of the manual labor. It's helping script um, communications. It's parsing out 
the volume of information in a log and bring into light that, hey, Bob, here's the six points that we saw constantly coming up. And here's the pattern that we saw in those logs and in the traces and in the uh, in the metrics. So it's bringing to light again. It's not necessarily something that can't be done, you know, as by a human, but the pace at which it can be done, you know, using you know, the the multivariate approach on this is just huge and very difficult for a human to do. But if given enough time, they could. These tools, these capabilities, and in AI ops in particular, are able to do this in you know in record time. You know, really kind of on pace with. What the business needs to um, to operate at. So we did touch on you know saying that we were, we're going to cover the wave a little bit. So I'm going to go through a, at a at a high level you know what is the wave uh, because I think it's really important to to highlight that. And this in particular is an example from a the process centric AI ops wave that was just released. A couple of big things to to think about when you think about a, a wave and how much rigor goes into it, both from the analyst community side as well as the vendor side. First of all, it's a comparative analysis. It is not a, it's not pinned to an industry standard. If the exact same wave is executed six months later, it could have different players. The scales could be different. The end results definitely could could be different because what happens is. Like I said, because it's a comparative analysis, every vendor, every technology is growing. It's advancing its capabilities. And the bar is set by, you know, where are vendors today? Where are they six months from now? And that's the role of the analyst to determine what is on par versus what's superior. And obviously that changes drastically, you know, moment to moment. Top providers, we only include between seven and 15. The analyst who is specializing in the space is basically taking that into account and saying, okay, who are the top providers of these technologies at this moment in time? Forrester is not a pay for play organization. We take in clients and non-clients. So the vendor community, they're, you know, if they're a top provider, whether or not they're a Forrester client, we, you know, they if I feel that they should be included, I'm going to include them. And then they can choose to participate or not participate. It's ultimately up to them. Obviously, if they don't participate, it is more difficult for us to pull out those answers and find the information from them. They have to fill out a, a extensive survey. And if they don't fill that out, you know, the burden is on, on the analyst to really kind of pull that out. And important to note here is when a vendor is filling out the, the survey and, and going through the whole process, which takes several months, there's no awareness of who their competitors are or what the scales are. So when a question is asked, it has to be answered to the best of the ability, and there's no ability, there's no opportunity to say, I'm competing against this other vendor, so therefore I'm going to change my answer this way. Everyone is blind to the competitors, as well as to how is this analyst going to score this? Because if you recall back to the on par piece that I was speaking earlier, once I see all of the answers and I understand what every where every vendor is now obviously going into it i know the space so i have a, a sense of where it is but if i see that the majority of the vendors are all providing something that may be the bar and maybe i thought going into it that was going to be superior and it turns out that that's the you know on par and then you know if you go above and beyond that that's what gets you the the higher level and then we, we're very strict with our inclusion criteria and this changes again based on what's going on at that moment in time in the market and what the analyst is seeing and hearing from the enterprises. So I looked at a single code base or a multiple code base with a single user interface. I want that director of IT, that director of service management to not have to worry about piecing together six different vendor products. Yeah, I want them to take one product, train their people in one way and move forward with that. Yeah, I already mentioned the process centric aspect of it. It is process rather than technology centric, and that's a very different perspective. Ultimately, same objectives, but it is it is what um, what the enterprises are really looking for. Obviously, relevance to Forrester clients, you know, the enterprise clients, those are the ones that are coming to me saying, "Hey, I'm speaking about this vendor. I'm, you know, I'm curious about that vendor." So we take that into account, and then the revenue is really just um, pretty simple, and that is. The enterprise, the Forrester clients, the enterprise clients are large scale enterprises. 
So we do set a, a minimum revenue target just because the vendors need to be able to handle that enterprise class and uh, organization you know, with their capabilities. So I, I did note the, the process centric versus technology centric. Very short here, basically what we're talking about is technology centric is your traditional APM monitoring, uh, highly technology oriented driving force to get to business insights. And they start at the, that reference architecture stack at the bottom and work their way up. Their strength is, you know, generally speaking at that lower level and it gets weaker as we move up. The process centric is the reverse of that. It's organizations that had very strong bases and very strong presence in operations management, service management. And what they're doing is again, to drive to business insights, improve business insights, they're driving downward and they're adding the things. So again, trying to get to the same point and same outcome, which is the business insights, but very different perspectives. And this is changing. Enterprises are starting to see these different perspectives and they're hoping that this really kind of collapses around, hey, I don't need to pick a perspective. I just need to pick a vendor. And, and that is changing pretty drastically. As far as the other two, the East-West type of organizations, Operation Line is just large organizations that have a large portfolio, but they haven't really brought it together under one umbrella for a solution. It's still a portfolio of products. And then AI Ops Lite is really just point solutions that support those 18 uh, capabilities that I spoke about earlier. You know, I spoke to the criteria in waiting. This is just an example of, of, that, uh, of what that is. It is pinned, when I, when I built out the wave, it is pinned back to that reference architecture. So what I was asking was, you know, what are the different categories of topics that I wanted to speak to? So you know, I have six out there. And, and those then are the high level areas where the criteria is then under that. So we have a lot more criteria in, the, in this process centric wave. There were 22 different current offering criteria within each of those. There may have been three to five separate questions. So you're looking at well over a hundred questions in the survey that need to be answered and, and, um, and supplied information for. There's a section on strategy. So for, again, from an enterprise perspective, you know, where are we going? How are we, you know, how are we gonna do this? And then the market presence again, to give that in, the large scale enterprise, the confidence that this vendor is capable of, of satisfying their, their needs. In terms of the analysis of what we, you know, what we found, what I found in this, in this particular wave, some of the key differentiating factors, the full stack native capability. So again, when you think about that enterprise, that global enterprise, that large scale enterprise, they, they have a whole host of technologies across their enterprise. So these AI ops solutions have to be able to handle all of that. And ideally, if you wanna move into that predictive stage, like I mentioned about the AI ops, you have to be able to do a lot of this at real time. And in some cases, not all the time, but in some cases, a third party option to go collect data or get data for you is not gonna really cut it. So you have to have a, uh, a pretty heavy native capability to really you know, rise to that leadership position. I spoke already about the experience piece, digital experience monitoring. That was a key component in what differentiated the top from the bottom. Contextual and experiential analysis, again, that kind of fits right in line with that. And lastly, on the differentiating factors is the automation. You know, the, taking that automation from detection all the way through remediation is key, even though some organizations are not quite comfortable with remediation piece, they, the vendors need to provide that. They need to provide that capability so that when the enterprise is ready, that it's, it's there. A couple of key takeaways. Yeah, I spoke a little bit about the full stack capabilities. Some vendors were a little bit too heavily dependent on third party and that limited their ability to be proactive, their ability to be predictive. Yeah, they kind of have to stay in that active and reactive stage. There was, you know, I, I did feel that, again, some of these vendors needed to expand their ability to collect that sensory and telemetry data in order to do those things. What I'm asking of AI ops, you have to be able to ingest and map the data a little bit more efficiently and a little bit more broadly. Real-time data utilization, obviously, that's, that's an obvious thing. Again, when you're taking data that is more sampled from a third party, it's hard to really consider some of those aspects being real-time, they're, they're a little bit reactive. 
And I already touched on declarative capabilities. So that's where, as I mentioned, sort of the, am I getting everything? When I acquire this vendor's AI app solution, am I getting all the capabilities or am I missing some capabilities? So obviously that's a real danger for the individual making that decision in the enterprise. And with that, John, I would like to pass that back to you. I thank everyone. We're gonna be on a little bit later with some questions and answers. So look forward to, to hearing your thoughts, John. Great, uh, thanks Carlos. And uh, thanks very much for that uh, comprehensive review uh, of, I guess not just uh, the, the process centric AI ops wave, but I mean the AI ops market uh, in itself. Um, I think some of the topics that you covered are really items that customers need to consider as they start pivoting towards adopting AI ops. So that was really, really good. Thanks for that. Um, and I also love the, clarif the clarification on meaningful use cases, which lead customers towards actionable and, um, and insightful information. But uh, I just wanted to take a, a minute on the Forrester process centric AOPS wave itself. Uh, and I want to summarize some of the aspects that went into generating this report. I know that uh, Carlos touched on it there as well. But what went into highlighting, or what went into BMC obtaining a leader position in this wave? So as you see from the graphic, BMC are placed at the top right-hand corner. And to gain this position, we had to work with Forrester across the three main categories that you see there. So current offering, strategy, and market presence. But it's also important to call out that within the area of like current offering, everything that we have to speak about or submit is live now. So it's generally available and customers are able to purchase those AI ops solutions right now today. Uh, within each one of these sections as well, we had to provide details on topics like how we do ingestion and service mapping, how we provide analysis and automation, what's our vision, what's coming next in the way of innovation and roadmap, um, and then details on revenue and customer numbers, all the kind of things that, uh, that Carlos mentioned. But all in all, it was a really, really comprehensive report that required questionnaires, surveys, customer interviews, demos, presentations, and so on. So really, really, um, really, really broad uh, report. So, so very happy that we came out in a leadership position on that one. And on this slide, what we wanted to kind of show that as part of our submission, we had to highlight the integration across our solution. So, this covered all the different data sources uh, that we can ingest data from, how easy it is we make for our customers to ingest that data onto the BMC Helix platform, how all of those different data sources are then handled within the BMC Helix platform, what algorithms we use, how they're applied, and then how all of this is presented to the end users as well. So across things like topology, events, metrics, logs, all of those come in from even different vendors, different sources, and how we can um, make the best use of all that data on the BMC Helix platform. But also where we're clearly differentiated as well when it came to our current offering, and I touched on this a little bit in, a, in the last slide, uh, and I think this really helped our submission as well as like our full stack capability. So the fact that we also have a really strong service management portfolio, that really helped our overall AI ops uh, story, I guess, and made our submission even more powerful. Um, so we love the fact that we got um, our, our ITAM portfolio, our observability and discovery type solutions, but also our service management combined uh, with our, um, our observability and discovery solutions made it a really, really powerful submission. And then finally, if we could go on to the last uh, slide here. The great news is everything that we see today, we get to everything that we've talked about today, we get to start experiencing that for ourselves as well. So we've created a, a self-guided demo, which customers can log on to sign up for and actually play with some of the use cases that we covered today. The QR code will take you straight to that online demo, or you can see the link on the bottom here, navigate to bmc.com and you'll find your way to doing this, um, this self-guided demo. I'd encourage everyone to try it. Once you start using it, you start getting your, your hands dirty, I guess, with the solution, you start seeing all the different use cases and the, the capability that we've built within the solution. So please do uh, log in, bmc.com, check out our AIOps self-guided demo, and you really get to see an awful lot of this in, uh, in action. So now I think we're going to move on to our Q&A section. I think we've got um, a first question uh, that we have here. So 
Carlos, this is a question for you. I guess it's talking back, I guess, to what uh, what we saw within the presentation uh, a while ago, and it's very specific. I guess a customer is asking us, you know, if a customer was considering adopting either a new AIOps solution or planning to migrate from an existing solution, from your point of view, then, Carlos, like what approach, what existing or what approach should they should they take uh, to kickstart this process? Uh, sure. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I guess the the main thing with a lot of these initiatives, you know, a lot of these com complex initiatives that span such a broad range of possibilities, is that you really need to begin with the end in mind. So you kind of almost need to work backwards, right? So you need to see what are the business outcomes you're trying to achieve. You know, what are the positive business outcomes that your organization needs you to to perform and execute? From there you work back and say, okay, well, what insights do I need in order to deliver that outcome, to deliver that capability, you know, to enable the business to grow, to enable the business to uh, improve the customer experience, improve the employee experience. So there's certain insights that you need in order to provide that outcome. Then you take one more step to the left and say, okay, in order for me to have those insights, what do I need for that? Well, I need visibility into my environment. I need to make sure I have all these different data points. I need to make sure that, hey, I'm pulling these data points out of the logs. I'm pulling these other data points out of the metrics uh, from the endpoint. I'm pulling these other pieces from maybe traces. I'm uh, pulling some of the digital experience piece to see, hey, when are the users, when are the customers, when are the employees, actually experiencing that that click rage you know I mean we, we yeah, I always chuckle when I hear that term but when you see that you say oh okay I need to capture all of this stuff not all this other stuff that's just noise and now you say okay I have the visibility I can create the insights and then those insights enable actions for me to actually drive the outcomes that my business partners need. So, you know, you, you like I said, you start with the end in, in mind all the way to the right, work your way back to the left. And then once you figure that out, you go forward with it. And those are the business cases that, or the use cases that you need to work through. Because if you just set out to like, hey, I'm gonna throw this tool out there and <clears throat> I'm gonna go do all these hundred different things, that may or may not achieve the goals that your business needs. So focus on the use cases, start again with, you know, on the right, work your way left. Now you know exactly what you need. Now you start implementing back from left to right. Yeah, I like that. So it's basically have the end goal in your mind the whole time and then kind of prioritize and work back towards that as opposed to trying to shoehorn, I guess, something into your organization. Exactly. That's really cool, exactly. yeah. Uh, okay, so we got a ton of questions. Lots of them um, have been bouncing in here um, over the last uh, couple of minutes, which is great to see. We did get a question here. Um, I guess it's like clarification. So there's so many AIOps solutions available. How do I choose the right? How do I choose the one that's right for my business? Everyone's going to be thinking about that. You know, what's right for me? How does um, how does this work or apply in my my case? Sure. Yeah, and and John, I guess the first thing, and and I ran into this. Um, Mid last year, you know, I started, you know, so as, a, as an analyst covering the space, I work both with the vendors to see what they're doing, what they're hearing, but we also have our Forrester clients that are coming in and, and having inquiries of things say, hey, we're considering doing this or we're, we're challenged with that. How do we go about it? And one thing that I, I found really quickly, and I, and I kind of touched on it in one of the slides, is this perspective concept. And when you think about it, I could be a VP of infrastructure driving this, this need for better insights, which ultimately drive business outcomes. And my domain and my scope of area of, of work and influence is really at that lower end. It's the APM, it's monitoring, it's engineering. And I work up the stack. If you think back to the reference architecture, you work up the stack and ultimately provide the insights provide some of the automation capabilities to the operations manager and to the service manager folks to actually execute. In the interim, I'm, I'm simplifying the environment. I'm maybe consolidating my engineering groups. I've done tech debt reduction. 
I've done all those sorts of things from that bottom up perspective. But that's if I'm a VP of infrastructure. I have that domain uh, and that's my charge. The flip side of this is that process centric and you're coming from the top down. I'm the director of service delivery. I you know, oversee the whole call centers and operations management and that sort of thing. Well, I don't have the same charge to reduce you know, the 17 monitoring tools. My charge is I just need the insights. And however that happens is really largely in, in part on my partners down at the lower levels. So what you want to, what you're driving to from that perspective is I need this in a clean fashion. I need it so that my folks who are not as technically involved as a you know, network engineer, that it's presented to them in a simpler way that all of the noise is eliminated. You know, they shouldn't be looking at you know, the, the bits and bytes in a router setting configuration type of thing. So, so we're coming down from that side, that process centric side. In the end, it doesn't really, you know, the, we're trying to achieve the same goals. It's insights for better business outcomes or more positive business outcomes. So, so you need to really kind of look at yourself and say, okay, who am I? You know, where I, am I in the organization? Am I running ITOM, ITIM, ITSM type stuff? That's my space. So I'm gonna drive down from the top, very process oriented. Those processes are going to be my drivers for what I'm improving, what I'm not improving, what I'm trying to achieve on a day to day. Or I'm a VP of infrastructure, I'm a you know director of engineering. I'm at the bottom saying, hey, my teams can't handle 17 monitoring tools anymore. We need to consolidate this. We need to simplify this in order to provide those insights for my colleagues at the at the other end. So, so really, it's really a question of who are you, what's your role, you know, and what angle are you coming at this from? But the but the bottom line is you're both trying to achieve the same thing: insights yeah. so that you can deliver better experiences. Yeah, I like that, and I, and it makes sense. Like you know someone's looking for a consolidated solution that caters for multiple users kind of within the within the organization and you don't want to choose something that becomes i guess the bane of your existence you know you need also something that's very intuitive um and that, that can be understood by multiple users in the org that, that's perfect like yeah um great i've got lots and lots of questions came uh here uh carlos it's a very popular topic but I got a, a, I guess a statement, but it was uh, looking for a bit of clarification behind the statement. It's like, you know, it seems to me that pretty much every organization can benefit from a process-centric AIOps outcomes, regardless of their IT maturity. Mm -hmm. So is that, is that a fair statement was the, the question put in there? Absolutely. I mean, look, the, the reality is, and I, and I was, you know, I was a director of IT for about 13, 14 years before joining Forrester a few years back. And, there isn't one organization out there that is running so smoothly that they couldn't benefit from this, right? If you think about what ultimately you're trying to achieve, you know, we, we have obviously this, this great, you know, uh, view of the, the ideal state, you know, like I said, I, in that reference architecture, I call it 18 different capabilities, but there's a tremendous amount of steps along the way. So yes, regardless of where your level of maturity is, you know, start small, start with you know just the simplification of things how things get transmitted from here to there if you if you're not that comfortable and a lot of organizations aren't in allowing the automation to actually execute things use the automation to go gather it use the automation to condense those 17 spreadsheets those four log files the six other you know databases whatever it is leverage the power of these automations and the AI aspect to, like I said, if you go back to my to the definition of AI ops, it's the enhanced human judgment. So if you just wanted to bring that to the surface, that's still a huge, huge benefit without getting worried about or getting too far down the, hey, we're not that mature for this or that. You know, the fact is you have people and you're paying them handsomely to go collect this spreadsheet that database, this other source, whatever, whatever, you know, the the multitude of sources that you have to pull together, if you use these tools for nothing other than that, you've already made a huge, um, uh, you've delivered a huge benefit to your organization. Obviously, then that sets you on a great footing 
to do to the next, to go to the next level, to bring in those change tickets, those incident tickets, to run those, correlate those against what's going on in the environment, to then go to that you know, root cause analysis, the causality. Are these things truly causal or are they just corollary? But again, all in the line of enhancing human judgment throughout the full life cycle of events of of the day to day, frankly. So tremendous opportunity, regardless of how mature or immature your organization is. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I think when you think about AI ops and the and the outcomes you're trying to achieve, and something we've reiterated throughout the, I guess the webinar today is yeah, where baselining where you are in terms of your maturity, and then you know rolling out the solution uh, from there makes sense. Kind of got a question, another question, Carlos. It kind of builds on that, but it's around. Um, it's around kind of APM solutions. So the question here is like some customers still consider that an, a, an APM solution fulfills most of what's offered in an AI ops solution. You know, can you talk a little bit about the AI ops differentials? Sure, I, I, I would disagree in that APM is much more focused in per its name, you know, application performance, right? AI ops and APM is much closer to observability, at least in how I've laid things out. You know, during the during the the slide deck piece, I spoke to this concept of inside out and outside in. So inside out, you're looking very specifically, very focused on a specific application, and ideally from top to bottom. There's you know different discussions around how far most of the observability tools actually go or don't go. Because many of them don't reach across from all the way from a user experience all the way down to potentially mainframe. So that's, that's a slightly different discussion. But APM itself is looking very focused on the application piece and that inside out. It is, it's charged with ensuring that application is doing what it needs to do within the you know, boundaries and, and um, uh, guidance that it's supposed to be operating. That is you know, very important, needs to happen, absolutely. AI Ops says, yes, we need that. But I also need to understand there are three applications around it that are not getting the attention that that one high criticality one is getting, that we've, in, we've um, applied all these extra energies towards our top five systems. But there's these other 30 systems around it. Some of them are sharing compute, some of them are sharing storage location. Obviously they're sharing bandwidth on networks. When we put APM in place, it's not necessarily across all these applications. AI Ops is saying, hey, no, I'm looking at the full ecosystem. Within it, I'm looking at this application as well. So therefore, I'm going to see things potentially on the network level, for example, independent of what's going on with that application, I see it at a network level issue. I see that there's a broader, bigger, more enterprise-wide issue going on well before that application is even impacted, okay? So now AI Ops says, I'm going to start addressing that. And that's, that's basically the, the example I was talking about with the uh, prosthetic or the glucose pump. It sees the sugar levels dropping. The kidneys may or may not have triggered things yet. It may have not, you know, already kind of called out, hey, something's going on. So while they work in conjunction, this is basically the, the relationship, and it is an area of, of, um, of challenge for me to, to get better reports, better in, uh, instruction out there for, the, for clarification of that relationship between APM, observability, and AI ops, because they're not one in the same. However, they overlap in many areas that ha is causing a lot of confusion in the market space. And again, that's that's basically my responsibility to, to help get that clarified. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, um, I guess, uh, summarizing like APM is part, uh, I guess, of an AI ops solution without being, with just being a subsection of it, without being the whole thing. Um, right. Kind of kind of building on that, that Carlos, we've got um, another question that kind of talks around this one, right? So does AI ops solutions integrate seamlessly with other prominent monitoring tools on the market or are complex configurations required? So complex, so what I guess what we're, this question is leading to, like they might have something out there today. They might have something rolled out in their company. They're thinking about migrating to AI ops or integrating to an AI ops. 
how do they go about that from a complexity point of view? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, at least from how I've defined it, um, if you're not if you're not integrating with all the other stuff, you you really shouldn't be calling yourself much of an AI ops tool, frankly. Uh, like the reality is, like I said, I, I spent nearly 15 years as director of IT in, in a global financial services company. There are no companies out there that only have one or two monitoring tools. They all have you know, a bazillion of them plus another two bazillion on the shelf somewhere, right? That's just the reality of it. So I, I pushed onto all of the vendors in both of the waves that I've, uh, that I've done in the last 12 months. I said, look, I, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna pose a unreasonable ask of you. I need you to do all these things in native fashion because that's an, op that's an opportunity for that director of IT, that VP of infrastructure to say, I'm going to retire 17 of these 30 monitoring tools because you can do it natively. But secondly, because you know the reality is most tech debt initiatives don't have, ever really come to fruition, I still need you, vendor, AI ops vendor, to do this in a third party fashion. So again, what I evaluated during both of the, the waves, you know, was I want and need the AIOps vendors to do both. You need to handle these complex multi-cloud hybrid environments and say, I'm going to pull these six monitoring tools that are already in-house and guess what? We're not getting rid of them. So AIOps vendor, you need to integrate with all of those, ideally, I want you to do it via hotel. I want you to do it in more an open source stuff. These other five, I need you to do natively because we're transitioning out of these, the license is ending, contracts are ending. I don't wanna pay for those again. I need you to do those natively. And the other ones that we left as third party, when they come up for renewal, I wanna possibly move off of those as well. So, so complex, absolutely. It, it's a must, frankly, for me, in my opinion, for an AI ops vendor tool set to be enterprise class, it has to handle that environment because if it doesn't, it's frankly closer back to just an APM, very targeted point solution type uh, product. Yeah, I think like that multi-source integration is crucial uh, for getting a, a comprehensive AI ops solution out there. Our VP of project, pro, product management here likes to highlight that you know he deals with customers and sometimes they say things like, oh, we've got two of everything, you know, two monitoring tools of everything. And then all of a sudden, they've got the, all these different tools that they're looking to consolidate and integrate the data to. You're not going to be able to get rid of those overnight. But I guess being yeah. able to ingest the data uh, is really the, the trick there, you know. Um, that's great. I think I've got like two questions uh, left uh, just for you today. Um, one is around an implementation uh, question. So the question is pretty straightforward, right? But but the answer, I guess, is going to be specific to, diff to different people. So the question is, from an implementation point of view, I know this is a journey. How long do you see that journey taking? Uh, you know, for each for each customer, or or even to get started for each customer. Yeah, I I guess what I would I'd rephrase it a little bit and say it's an adoption of a philosophy. Okay, yeah. so there is a journey to to get going on it, but the first step is a, is a an acceptance that hey we're going to operate differently, we're going to aggregate all this information together, we're going to get this into more of a a singular viewpoint, and I, I'm deliberately avoiding saying single pane of glass because I I hate the term. Mm -hmm. um, but you're trying to get this into a singular place that both ends of the spectrum, the service side and the engineering side are looking at the same data. They're looking at it maybe through different interfaces on the same tool, but they're looking at the same data. You can, I mean, I've seen some of these implementations, you know, go super, super quick, you know, like two, three months installed and starting to deliver value. Um, especially if you leverage some of the native capabilities that are like, hey, we can turn this on. It's going to do our topology map. It's going to pull back all this um, raw data from across the enterprise, literally almost over, overnight, because it is real time. Yeah, I spent I spent a couple of decades on CMDB and configuration management stuff. It's not that ETL, you know, extract, transform, load kind of approach. Uh, there's some component to that here in AI ops, but most of it is real time. Uh, it's pulling the logs, it's pulling those traces, all that sort of stuff in, in real time. And 
you can get some of this capability, some of this value super quick. You know, we're talking literally like within weeks and months, you can start getting some of it. Now, are you going to have the full environment in sort of this mapped stage where you've validated all the maps and all that? No, of course not, especially if you have a, a larger environment. But the the real time maps, those things, again, if it's a if it's a good uh, tool set, you will have those real time maps like you know within you know I don't want to say minutes, but basically you're going to have those very very quickly, assuming everything's online and whatnot. And what you're able to do is because it's in a real time capability, you can drill into that. You can walk all the way back. A lot of the the AIOps tools have sort of a, a timeline kind of window thing where you can literally scroll back and see what happened. Uh, some of them even go all the way into the end user if they have the digital experience capability to see what was the user doing at that moment in time when the transaction forked and started going sideways and started causing issues. So you can literally just scroll back the time window and see that. So, you know, timeline to value, it's super, super quick. Obviously, one of your biggest problems, frankly, is, is probably going to be cultural, getting people to buy into it, accepting new ways of doing it. But this is, there is a journey component, but really it's a philosophical adoption, a mindset that you're going to move in this direction rather than a project that starts and ends. It is a different way to operate your uh, the IT operation space. Yeah, got it. And... And listen, this is our last question, I think, for today. Um, and it's not something that um, you know that that uh, we kind of put in there ourselves. All right, this is definitely one that came in from a, from an attendee today. So the question is: Can Carlos speak to why BMC scored at the top of the wave, and what BMC is doing better than anyone else in the AOPS um, space? And, and I guess we're we're very proud, right, of where we've come uh, on this report. We put a he heck of a lot of uh, effort into it. Uh, and that's from all sides of our organization. But I guess this attendee would be interested to hear from from you kind of where BMC or why BMC did so well in it. Sure. So, I mean, I'll speak to it a little bit in a generic in a generic fashion. Um, when, you know, and I, and I spoke to, you know, we spoke to the inclusion criteria. We spoke to what it takes to to go through the wave. Uh, and, the, and the bar is high. And it is, again, it's comparative analysis. The way I see AIOps, and, and again, the reference architecture kind of calls it out, right? I see it as a uh, 18 different capabilities. Each of each of those, not each of them, but most of those each are um, vertical areas that warrant, you know, incredible amount of energy. Having been uh, in the director of ITC for, for years, I put myself in that in that position when I execute the wave. And I say, what would I need? What would I, uh, when I'm evaluating the apps tool, when I'm talking to different to the different vendors, what would I need? I says, well, frankly, I need something because I was in a, a big global financial services company. I need a, a organization, a vendor product that's going to give me as much flexibility as possible because I know my space, I know my company. We're a mess. We're not that mature. We have, you know, this over here, that over there. I think we have 17 monitoring tools. It's probably 35. Uh, I think we have 16 different processes. It's probably like 24, that sort of thing. So I'm looking at the vendors and saying, I need you to give me as much flexibility as possible because I suspect that as soon as we kick this off, I'm going to run into all sorts of stuff that I just never expected. So I need a tool that's going to give me flexibility. I need a tool that's going to give me the option to, as I was speaking earlier, I need you to connect it for day one. I'm just gonna connect this all on a third party fashion because all those tools are there. I don't have the energy and I don't have the clout to go eliminate some of those monitoring tools. But I know that we have initiatives coming up for you know, environmental simplification that I need them to do it in a native way. So when you put this all together, it's a big ask of the vendors. And when I'm doing the scoring, as soon as you start saying, hey, we don't, and, and in this case, in the process-centric wave, there were some vendors that are, they do a great job right in the middle of my reference architecture, but they don't do the ingestion piece on their own. They're, they're solely reliant or highly reliant on third parties. 
So if I go, if I put my director of IT hat back on and say, hey, I still got to go get these other tools. I still have to manage this. I have to manage integrations. I, as you know, as the analyst doing this evaluation, like that's good that you do that, but I need I need more. So the vendors that tend to score, we score one, three, or five, or zero, you don't have the capability. One is below par, three is on par, five is above par. As soon as you start taking any one of those 18 capabilities and the different questions around them or the use cases that I challenge people with, the vendors with, as soon as you start doing anything, frankly, below par, the odds of you staying in the top ranking are almost minimal because there's always at least one or two vendors. And in this particular case, you know, BMC you know, tended to score in that on par or above par in most of the uh, questions. And that's for all the waves. The ones that end up at the top of the stack are the ones that are able to handle all of those criteria at minimum on par with their peers and competitors. And then in many cases above par against their competitors and their peers so so very long answer to you know to, to the question but basically you know again bmc ultimately was one of the vendors that you know was either on par or above par on all the questions so uh and again that's a just a generic um aspect to how the waves usually you know kind of come come into play I oh, appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate that answer. Um, okay, well, I think we've had um, an awful lot of interaction from uh, the attendees today. So I really want to thank everyone from that point of view. Thank you for everyone for signing up and attending today's webinar. I just want to close, I guess, here. Thank everyone. And uh, thanks again, Carlos, for, for attending.